Good morning. Uh, our topic today is what kind of change uh, and attitude, what kind of mentality, mindset is needed to make change happen. It's a wide open topic of great importance. Uh, we all know that attitude, uh, mindset is everything. We know that from our own experience, and we know that from the children and young people that we have the privilege to teach. So uh, this morning, I have the privilege to introduce um, Oliver uh, Perkovich, founder and director of Skatistan, a nonprofit that connects with youth, especially girls from low-income uh, backgrounds, challenging areas in Afghanistan, South Africa, Cambodia, uh, to help them build the skills and confidence for a brighter future. So uh, Oliver, per Oliver uh, Perkovich would like to first show you a video uh, before he comes on stage. So enjoy, and we'll be talking soon. به نظر ما واقعا در افغانستان یعنی در مزار به خصوص Skateboarding really make a people different mind, creative. Skateboarding is for everybody, not just one person. Hi. I'm Oliver Perkovich, and I'm a small part of why skateboarding is actually the largest sport for girls in Afghanistan. And you also just saw uh, uh, some in images from northern Afghanistan, from Mazar Sharif, and there there is the highest concentration of female skateboarders anywhere in the world. How's that possible? It was, it's possible by listening to children and becoming a champion for them. I went to Afghanistan uh, originally in 2007 and I brought a skateboard with me. I went there because my girlfriend at the time got a job there and I went there looking for a job and I, I skateboarded in the, in the streets and everywhere I went, kids were fascinated by the skateboard. And at the time, there were, there were three main impressions that I, that I firstly had of, uh, of, of Afghanistan. And that was that women played such a small role in society. There were no women driving cars around, there were no girls riding bicycles, no women serving me in shops. Another, another impression was that Afghans really weren't at the center of development in their country. It was international experts. There were ideas from Helsinki, from uh, New York, London, everywhere in the world. Afghans weren't actually part of the, of the development process and it didn't seem like a sustainable way of, of doing things. And the third thing that really struck me was that half of the population in Afghanistan was under the age of 15, 70% under the age of 25. And um, this enormous demographic needed to be engaged with in, in some way to do, to, do things into the, to do things into the future. So anyway, I'm there in Kabul, finding my way around. I'd traveled to over 40 countries before going to Afghanistan. I grew up in Papua New Guinea. I was very comfortable. Um, being uh, in the streets of Kabul and, and skateboarding around, and the children were fascinated by the skateboard. And they were basically not giving me my skateboard back. And I thought, well, if Afghans need to be listened to, and children are such a big part of the demographic, well, if the children are asking for my skateboard, why don't I give it to them? Or why don't I try to find out find some more skateboarding, uh, some more skateboards for them. So I started to run these little skateboard sessions 
in the park at a at a high school after after school, in a uh, and we found this empty fountain as well, that was uh, perfect for perfect for skateboarding in, and uh, the fountain was great because the in the in the park the ki kids kept on running away with my skateboard and I had to chase after them and I only had two skateboards so it was very important that um, I could sort of keep them contained in a in a certain area here you can see the see the fountain. And the fact that girls wanted to do it was so exciting to me. Girls weren't playing soccer, they weren't uh, uh, flying kites, they weren't allowed to do any of these activities because they were deemed sports for, uh, activities for boys. And I realised that there was a loophole. Because skateboarding was so new, there were no rules, societal rules, that girls couldn't do it. And so I thought, well, how can, we, how can I uh, encourage this? So I simply gave the girls more time to skateboard than the boys. And of course, because the girls had more time to skateboard, they became better than the boys at skateboarding. And I ran little competitions, very rigged ones, where, uh, and the girls beat the boys in every age group, up to the age of 12, because over the age of 12, uh, Boys and girls need to be uh, separated in, in Afghan society. And um, so the, 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 girls, the, the girls were the, were the champion skateboarders. Skateboarding started to be seen as an activity for, for girls. And um, from, from this, I realised how could the girls also then keep on doing it past... Uh, uh, past, past 12, and I thought, well, it has to be an indoor space. And um, at the same time, really getting to know the children, what did they really want? And what they wanted, what they told me that they wanted, uh, is to go back to school. 80,000 children on the streets of Kabul do, uh, are street working, sometimes from the age of five years old, six years old, and the only thing that they wanted to do was go back to school. But School in Afghanistan goes for two hours a day. Um, it's either in the morning or, or, or at night time, or, or in, the, in the afternoon. And um, it's rote learning. They're not learning, they weren't learning any critical thinking skills. And I thought, well, if these children are going to inherit these enormous problems in the country, they need a better education. And these foreign experts that are coming here uh, charging $1,000 a day to, to somehow develop the country, they're not going to be the solution in the long run either. It's all about Afghans doing it, but they need some, uh, a better basis. So um, I, the, the, one of the girls, Fazilla, who was a, a really good uh, skateboarder, I wanted to build out these, the, the, the girls' skateboarding program. So I did a deal with her parents where she, would, she was allowed to go back to school, she was 12 years old, if she could become a skateboard instructor with me. And I paid her a dollar a session because I was living on about $15 a week. It wasn't, uh, it seemed absolutely crazy to, to anybody else that was in, in uh, in, in Kabul, most people were working for the UN or, or other foreigners that I knew. What was I doing in the park with these kids with no money at all and <laughs> somehow without any security, it, it just made absolutely no sense to them. But I started to put these ideas together and it's like, maybe we can have an indoor facility where the girls will be able to do it past 13 because this is what they're asking for. They want a skateboard. They want to uh, access uh, school. Let's put it together and build a school with a skate park in it. So I started knocking on donors' doors and uh, everybody thought that I was pretty crazy, but it was like, it wasn't my idea. I thought it was crazy myself. This is what the children had asked for. Let me be their champion. Let me see if I can actually get it for them. And it, it was imp they were the ones that really needed to have a voice and to be listened to. So um, firstly, the, the Canadians uh, uh, government gave $5,000, then the Norwegian government doubled that, and the, the Danes then got involved, the German government got involved, and together we built the largest indoor sports and education facility in the country for kids.
And, and the, the opening in October 2009 was the happiest day of my life. It was, it was such an incredible thing that these children from, that had come, that were skateboarding in the fountain, all of a sudden had this amazing space that was theirs, that they had also helped to, they helped to build the ramps, they were part of it. It was a little community that had started to grow. And we had classrooms and we did creative arts-based activities in the, in the classroom so that they would learn creative skills, critical thinking skills, things that would help them going forward. Then the children said, well, we love coming to Skater Stan, but we also want to go to regular school. So we listened to the children again, and we started a back-to-school program, which was an accelerated learning program where they did three years of regular school in one year with us, and they could still come to Skater Stand and take part in uh, Skate and Create, the other uh, thing. But listening to the kids, again, it made sense to them. It was what they wanted, and I was simply their, their champion and, and helped them do that. Where, where does listening to the children get you? It gets you to places that you would never have imagined. Skater Stand has grown all over the world. We built a facility in northern Afghanistan that's three times the size of the one in Kabul. There, and and that's, uh, we have a thousand children coming to that, that space every, every single week in northern, northern Afghanistan. And uh, we've all ex also in Cambodia and South Africa. We've uh, won lots of awards, NGO of the Year, all of these um, UNICEF uh, education through sport awards. These, these awards come from the children's ideas, not from me. My, I, I studied chemistry. I didn't know anything about education, about uh, international development. I, I was simply listening to them and following what they, uh, what, what they thought would what, what they thought would work. So I'd like to leave you with a, a story of Norzo, who was one of the children at the, at the fountain. I, I met him when he was 11 years old, and he had, he was this, he was tiny, and he had this uh, dirty shower kameese, which is the, the local uh, uh, clothing garment, and he had scales like uh, that you that you weigh yourself with around, uh, hanging around his neck. These massive scales on this tiny little uh, tiny little kid, and he would weigh people for one or two cents. That's how he that's how he made uh, made a living for his for his parents. And um, he was a really he really loved skate, uh, skateboarding straight away. And uh, he, start, he became then a volunteer, and then he was an educator in Kabul. And then when we uh, built in Mazar Sharif in the north, he went there. And since then, he's taught thousands of children um, skateboarding and uh, creative arts-based education in, in northern Afghanistan. He then he finished high school. He went to law school. He's graduated law school. And last week, he was in Phnom Penh, where we had uh, a gathering of all of our, uh, all of our educators from the, the our lead educators from around the around the world and it's just you know out of these 80,000 street working kids in Kabul somehow he rose to the rose to such unexpected uh, heights and today skateboarding is actually synonymous with education in Afghanistan and I couldn't be I couldn't be prouder and I, I think if I can just leave you with one thing, just as Afghans needed to be in the centre of their development process and still need to be, children also need to be front and centre in any sort of uh, moving forward to do with innovation in education. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Oliver. That was a wonderful story. I've, I've heard it, I think, two, three times by now, and I love it each and every single time. So 
Uh, and, and obviously, you tapped into uh, the change that wanted to happen, and you went with it, right? That was really amazing. So, uh, and now we're going to have a conversation with um, uh, Jessica Spencer Keys, uh, as well as uh, Catalina uh, Gonzalez. Uh, Jessica Spencer Keys is the head of uh, global research at 100, whose uh, research and analysis with a plethora of, of data that they have collected over uh, the, the past. Um, recent months and, and years has been uh, nothing short of amazing. So we have the pleasure of having her come on stage to, to discuss this important topic with us, as well as uh, Catalina Gonzalez, who is the uh, founder and director of Literacy for All, uh, whose program re uh, reaches children in, in hard-to-reach communities and teaching them uh, about uh, literacy and numeracy skills through play. So Catalina Gonzalez and Jessica Spencer Keys. All right, my three esteemed guests. Uh, well, who would like to go first about the, the question of uh, what kind of attitude is needed to, to make change happen? I'll go first. Uh, so good morning, everybody. I, I've been thinking about this question um, lately, and uh, I, I came up with three things. And I'm going to say three very bad words, so be advised. You can you know, <laughs> close your ears if you need to. Uh, but here are my three, my three things um, for this mindset. Um, being intolerant, being impatient, and being naive. So three things that we have learned to be really bad, but let me explain. Being intolerant, intolerant about the inequality that exists in the world, about the fact that children are not learning how to read or write today when we are talking about digital literacy and digital skills. Uh, and we cannot just accept that. We cannot accept how things are. Being impatient, impatient at the pace at how change is taking place. When we say, oh yeah, in 2030, all children will have education, quality education. How can we wait for that? <laughs> there are children that need us now, not in 30 years. I'm being naive because if we think about the magnitude of the challenges that are involved in doing any of the things that we do in the communities that we work with, we will never move. Have one extra. Think big, for sure. But don't forget how important the small is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it starts with us, but it also is that child, that parent, that teacher. So think big, go big, but don't forget how important the small is. Those will be my four things. Wow, <laughs> amazing. I think my insights have come from the incredible interviews I've had with many of the innovators here and the research team. And in the last two years, really understanding what innovators like you are doing and what kind of attitude you will have and I've kind of also seen a few different common factors. The first of which is the ability to actually exactly what Oliver said in his speech to listen and to put the power of the need into action. So it's this extreme ability to be adaptive and flexible and to listen and to create teams and harness the power of the community to evolve and weave this in a really impactful and scalable way. And I think the innovations, especially that are working at scale, are all kind of the innovators are working in that kind of direction. Um, and secondly, there's a lot of there's a lot of difficulty about how innovators can collect research and evidence, but the innovations that are working at impact and scale find a smart way to incorporate data-driven um, insights into what they do. And that doesn't have to mean like a cumbersome five-year-long longitudinal study. It can mean jotting down your notes after your interviews and bringing that to your team and reflecting on that. It can be collecting stats from surveys. And I think when innovations are working at impact and scale, that really helps them communicate their ideas and create informed decisions, but also helps them get funding, right? Which is also one of the things that needs to happen to support the change that needs to 
happen in the world, really. Great, great. Well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Catalina. Um, so, um, Oliver, is there something you'd like to, I guess, add in addition to yeah, what you have already yeah, talked be, about? Be open, yeah. be good at uh, listening, and uh, don't think that you know it all. We can, there's, we, we know very little, and there's so much that we can learn, and we've got to keep, keep, keep remembering that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, listening is such a key skill um, that uh, never gets worn out as a, as a skill to practice. So. Uh, listening to the intuition within for what needs to be done, listening to society, uh, what, what needs to happen. So absolutely, I think uh, that, that's wonderful. So in, intolerance and patience. And, and uh, a little bit of picture. naiveness, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, now, uh, what I'm curious about is uh, obviously all of these uh, things that uh, you've, you just talked about are, are, are highly important. Um, and that, that will get you started, that will keep you going. But in the long run, right, we want to, uh, how do we make change scale, right? Um, is there anything uh, that, you know, you'd like to say about that and in, in, in spreading the, the, the impact of the work that you do, so? I can start. I, th yeah. I think uh, for scaling of Skaterstan, community was absolutely essential. It started with one, it became two, it became four. And uh, at the moment, 70% uh, of our staff at Skaterstan, we've got 105 staff, 70% are former students. And it's changed their life. They've taken on the culture and the, the mindset that, that we have. They understand it. And that's the way that you have then integrity at scale because you've got a, you've got a similar culture that is uh, being, being replicated out. It, it, it looks different in every, every place, mm. but uh, the, the, there, there is a common, common culture. Right, right. Community is absolutely important. Yeah. I think as well what the power of community does is to also translate across to different stakeholders. And I think the innovations that are working at scale are usually really good at translating this out, whether it's through videos, or speeches, and different types of media. I think, as Passy mentioned this morning, that is really key to be able to work at scale into multiple different countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will also add maybe uh, results and acceptance from different communities. Um, so it, you know, in, in my experience, um, you know, you can do a lot of planning, but sometimes the the way you scale happens very organically, mm -hmm. and is because of what you are doing makes sense in different contexts, and people can adapt and uh, uh, take that easily mm -hmm. and adapt it for their environment. So I think having a solution that allows for that flexibility and adaptability uh, can take, uh, you know, can take us a long way. So, so there is a fascinating point, uh, Catalina. I think uh, when we talk about scale, I come from the, the business world, actually, previous to my, my, my current work in education. And in business, we, they, they talk about scale in, in a very different sense, I think, uh, kind of systematic, mechanical, and almost like you know, conquering countries, kind of a mentality and approach. But in the work that we do, which is very uh, human in its essence, and you talk about organic uh, growth, and adaptability, flexibility, I wonder um, how do we keep our work organic and, mm -hmm. and relevant and pertinent to, to humanity as we spread the impact that we make? Yeah, and I, I, I probably go back to Oliver's point in his presentation about being very observant and also what you just said about learning constantly, right? So that's what keeps us fresh and, um, and not very static because when you are able to observe what the needs are and how people are responding to your solution and what changes you need to make or what changes or opportunities exist out there, you are able to quickly adapt to that and uh, they, they never stop learning, right? Mm. Jessica said, weavers, right? Yeah. So it's, it, this is not a finished product. It's kind of like something you're constantly uh, creating and recreating um, with the community in a way. Yeah, and I think as well, um, it's really coming back down to what the essence of learning is for. And I think when the innovators are really taking that on board and, and also listening to the children and to the teachers and exactly what they need, that can really help transform the lives of everybody. Hmm. So going back to listening, really. Yeah. Yeah. Always paying attention. Yeah. It's that power of intuition alongside research and insights. 
Great, great, okay. People want to be listened to, children want mm. to be listened to, and mm. when you take those things into account, you're going to have a bigger success in the, in, in the, in the long run. Right, right. And yeah, I mean, what really strikes me when I, when I first I read the, uh, the Global Research Report that uh, interviewed all the youths, parents, um, communities, and systems level thinkers, educators, mm. yeah, indeed, I think uh, the work at 100 that you have done uh, that the organization has done has exemplified that approach to, to really listening to all stakeholders. So listening indeed, but comprehensive uh, listening, right? So um, my other, please. I guess I'll just add in a plural, plural, <laughs> plurality of uh, voices. Um, as a white male, I definitely, th there seems to be a lot of uh, white male people Give, putting out ideas and those things, there needs to be so many other voices there as there as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I realise that I, yeah, that's a privileged uh, privileged position, and it shouldn't be that way going going forward. Mm -hmm. There's got to be there has to be more more role models and more diverse role models. And I think that also goes to sustainability, right? Once the community takes ownership or the school takes ownership over that idea that you brought to the table, then there is sustainability because it will remain active whether you are measuring or not measuring, where you're there taking pictures or not taking pictures, right? It will remain in the community. Yeah. And you may not be able to necessarily track, you know, after a while, but it doesn't matter because it's there and people feel like there's a solution that they can take with them. Yeah, it's so important to empower the people where the change needs to happen, and especially with students, which is what we did with the Youth Voice Survey, really listening to what they have to say to make sure the innovations we selected here today were driven by their needs as well. Great, great, okay. So, uh, yes, empowering people is, is absolutely, uh, I think, foundational to, to making change happen. And another uh, thought that I, I had around this was uh, the, the, the importance of uh, modeling the change that we want to have happen, right? Mm -hmm. So what can you say about, uh, about that, right? So many of us uh, have opinions about what needs to be done, but what about you know, being the change that needs to happen? What do you have to say about that? I think the growing movement for um, innovators and social entrepreneurs in this sort of second wave generation is that we're learning that we have to take time for ourselves and we have to really make the time to, um, to love ourselves and show that model to students and to teachers and to our teams and through the innovation. So I think there's a different way of working where the new CEOs and the new people who are leading the change are working in flatter hierarchies and they're recognizing that there's autonomy and there's differences out there and people need to be recognized for their inclusivity and, and to embrace that diversity and complexity in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think when we do that and we really speak honestly and transparently and authentically, I think that's gonna, uh, it's gonna really help. Mm, okay. I'm also thinking, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go. Uh, I'm also thinking about the fact that it's almost like something that I don't think about, right? It's mm -hmm. like these enormous, powerful force, right? That if you ask me, why do you do this? I'll say, because this is the only thing I can think of. Mm. Because this is so important and so relevant to me and to others mm. that my brain cannot stop thinking about this. So it's almost like an obsessive, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> an obsession with this idea of what I see needs to happen, and if not me, who is going to do it? Mm -hmm. uh, and how can we empower these communities to continue, mm -hmm. right? So they don't have to rely on me or in anybody else. Right, right. And I think, you know, in that sense also for me, the power of literacy is so important because it gives people this amazing tool to learn and continue to learn and to transform their own lives. Right, so. right. So I, I think what you just said is really powerful because, in fact, uh, the, you know, the fact that you, you had to do this, there was no other way. I mean, to, to my mind, you empowered yourself first, which in a way is modeling kind of uh, what you're, you're, you're doing for uh, the youth and children that you're working with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, really powerful, yeah. Okay. Um, any last uh, comments? Um, I guess we're coming to uh, a close to this conversation, which I think can 
you know, can continue for some time, but uh, I want to respect the time as much as possible. A any uh, closing comments? Change, uh, change yeah. can happen uh, top down as as well as bottom up. It's 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 important that mm -hmm. uh, things are things are balanced. Yeah. Great. It's always happening. It's always happening. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be afraid to fail because everybody can. I love that. Don't be afraid yeah. to fail. Well, thank you so much.